गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन माई सर डॉक्टर स्नेहल पटेल ज्वाइंट कोऑर्डिनेटर ऑफ इंडियन एसोसिएशन ऑफ फिजियोथेरेपी वुमेन सेल महाराष्ट्र स्टेट सो टूडे आई वेलकम यू ऑन दी ओकेजन ऑफ वुमेन्स डे सो टूडे अवर द टॉपिक इज द इनसाइट ऑन लेक्टेशन so let me first introduce and uh, one more thing so this webinar is live on our iip women cell facebook page uh, so our national head dr ruchi vachne ma'am our west zonal head dr pooja kamle madam and our state coordinator dr suvarna ganveer ma'am myself snehal patel joint coordinator and our sub coordinator dr uttara mohan dr priya and dr nirali sangvi so i welcome you uh, madam can you hear me hello thank yeah. you thank you so much welcome dr nigmaja madam so let me give a small introduction of your so madam is a pediatric physio and a women's health professional with experience of 26 years she is presently attached to kda hospital copper kene as a consultant lactation counselor she is regularly conducts childbirth education classes pregnancy fitness postnatal classes and lactation counsel for both online as well as offline she has conducted awareness session on common women's health concerns such as pelvic floor health bladder and bowel health osteoporosis and a series of training uh, for anganwadi workers for navi mumbai municipal hospitals on the back care and safe exercise for a pregnant woman she is a servant as serve as a consultant antenatal and postnatal professional in fortis hospital washi and motherhood hospital khagar she is experienced supporting a woman during labor assisting family to provide a natural pain relief during labor she has conducted a long workshop for working women professional in a corporate sector on women's health concern and well being she is graduated a gold medalist from government institute of rehabilitation medicine chennai in 1994 and she is a ch certified childbirth educator and certified lactation educator from capppa she is a keen a learner and keeps updating the professional skills through the various workshops and seminar she believes in the power of simplicity complex professional and concepts and jargon needs to be simplified for clinical practice this she feels shall enhance a better outcome for our clients and ease compliance to best and evidence based practice by us and clinician i welcome you ma'am our participants can ask uh, put their questions on the chat box we will answer at the end of the session thank you ma'am continue thank you dr snehal thank you for a nice lovely introduction um so uh, thank you for the uh, iap the mensel for giving me an opportunity to talk to all of you all so should i share the screen yes ma'am you can share the screen <laughs> is my screen visible yes ma'am it's visible okay so uh, so i am going to discuss with you about uh, lactation and uh, how you can you know as a physiotherapist you are already a physiotherapist you can expand your practice uh, into the area of lactation so if you are already a women's health physiotherapist and you know this is one more area which we can include because of our uh, a uh, good understanding about anatomy physiology and all it is going to become easier for you to enter into this new role so i will give some insights into what i have been doing or you know how i have been doing my work so uh, which may be helpful to you so i have three simple objectives for today's session so i want uh, uh, to give a little bit understanding of the physiology of lactation everything in correlation with how you will apply it in your clinical practice and uh, let us see how as a lactation professional our 
scope of practice is going to be, whether you see them in the antenatal period, um, in bedside, postnatal period, or later on as an OPD consult, how your scope of practice can be, and how you can um, get yourself into uh, this profession of being a lactation professional. So first, the um, breast anatomy as physios, we all like to start with the anatomy and the physiology. So uh, we all know that the uh, mammary glands are not having any attachment to the bones. So, you know, there is no muscle or bone. It is not a self-support weight structure. So they are suspended using the suspensory ligament. Uh, and uh, there are multiple lobules which have um, hundreds of alveoli into each lobule. All these lobules are arranged radically around the breast tissue. And each uh, lobule has multiple alveoli which are lined with epithelial cells. And these are the these epithelial cells are going to produce the milk. And you know they all have tiny ductules which then form the lacticarous ducts which are going to come together. They all converge at the <clears throat> areola and they all come out through the nipple pores. So the milk is going to come out through the nipple pores. As compared to a bottle, the nipple does not have a single pore. It has multiple pores. Around 10 to 20 pores can be there through which the milk is going to come out. So uh, the uh, when we understand the anatomy, many times, you know, uh, when you have a postnatal mother, they are going to ask questions like, uh, you know, what do I do to tone up the breast? So, you, you know, because of your anatomical and physiological background, it becomes easy for us to communicate to them that, you know, the breast cannot be toned. There is no muscle inside. You can, at, the rest, at best, you can tone up the pectoral muscles which are behind, but it requires good supportive, you know, uh, bras so that, you know, the, uh, the breast tissue will not get very slack. <clears throat> so, so after the anatomy, let us go towards the stages of lactation. So there are five distinct stages in the lactation phase. So before the breast is capable of making milk and you know all those things. So these are the stages which are going to be there. The first one is the mammogenesis. So as the name only suggests, the formation of the mammary glands. And we all know it is going to happen in utero, in the fetal stage, you know, in the early weeks of pregnancy that the mammary glands, the rudimentary mammary glands are going to develop. And then comes the uh, stage, you know, even in uh, once the mammary glands form, they, uh, the glandular tissue are going to develop only when the puberty starts as the pituitary hormones are getting activated. So with the, uh, you know, uh, estrogen and progesterone levels building up, the glandular tissues are going to them and the glandular tissues are interspersed with lot of fat patch which gives protection to the uh, growing glandular tissue. So it is in pregnancy that the lactogenesis one will start. So uh, uh, wherein the uh, epithelial cells which are in the uh, uh, individual alveoli, they are getting converted or getting differentiated into lactocytes. So it is during pregnancy that the breast develops the potential to secrete milk. Before that, it is not possible for the uh, you know, lactation to get initiated. So this is important, especially if it is an adopted child, you know, uh, adopted uh, mother wanting to lactate. So the process is much more tedious because the secretory differentiation has not happened. But at the same time, if a mother who has already had a previous pregnancy or she had given birth, she wants to start lactation again, stop due to some other reason, which is called a relactation, it is possible because the secretory differentiation has happened. Right? So this secretory differentiation happens <clears throat> in the mid-pregnancy. So from mid-pregnancy, say around 22 to 24 weeks onwards, the epithelial cells have become converted into lactoside and cholesterol has started to form. 
So if the mother is going to deliver early, say around 26, 28 weeks, this mother, if it is a preterm delivery, this mother will be able to lactate, right? So from mid-pregnancy onwards, this uh, lactogenesis is beginning. So it is possible for a mother to begin lactation from mid-pregnancy onwards, right? And this lactogenesis one will end on day two, wherein after the birth of the baby, there is going to be a drop in the levels of progesterone. So the, as the progesterone levels are going to drop down and there is a surge in the levels of prolactin and oxytocin levels, so then we move towards lactogenesis 2 where there is activation. See here, one important thing we need to remember is the lactogenesis 1 will be there uh, means, you know, with, with the pregnancy, the milk production will start in the second trimester onwards. And with the birth of the baby, once the placenta is expelled and prolactin level rises, the cholesterol will be released, right? So, but, so for that, for some reason, if the mother is not feeding the baby, you know, baby is in an ICU or for some reason, one or two days, the mother did not feed the baby, that will not come in the way of milk production, right? So because the lactogenesis 1 is there and then the lactogenesis 2 will happen. See, the lactogenesis 2 happens from day 3 after birth till day 8 after delivery, this is the time which is very crucial because this is the time where there is secretory activation. Means, uh, this is the time usually the mother says that milk has come in. So, if the mother starts seeing the white milk, right? So, in this period, what happens is the individual lactosides, they get more receptive to the level of prolactin in the blood. So as the prolactin level rises, the lactosides become more responsive to the prolactin and they start making more milk. So with frequent feeding, the prolactin levels keeps on increasing several times in the day. So the lactosides become more receptive and they start increasing the milk production, right? So this Secretory activation is a, we can say it is like calibration of the breast to produce milk on that lactation cycle. So if the mother has to make plenty of milk, if the mother wants to do exclusive breastfeeding, this lactogenesis too is very important because this is the time the alveoli are getting more signals. The lactosides are getting more signals so that their milk producing capacity is enhanced, right? So in this period of time, if milk removal does not happen or the baby is not suckling, if the baby, uh, you know, is in the NICU, if it is a preterm birth, you know, baby and mother are separated. So if milk removal is not happening, either by pumping or with the baby actively suckling, the breast goes into involution because the secretory activation doesn't happen and the uh, lactosides are not getting more signal. So then it starts involuting or it reduces the milk production. So this can come in the way of future uh, capacity to make milk in that lactation cycle. It is for that pregnancy, not for future pregnancies, for that pregnancy. So it is very important if you are working in the area of lactation to be able to communicate this to the mother so that she will ensure that uh, in this period she will actively nurse the baby or if the baby is not next to the mother then she will have a regular pumping schedule right so after this period from the eighth day from the ninth day onwards till the entire lactation cycle we move towards the stage called the galactopoiesis where the maintenance of milk production is not dependent on the prolactin levels in the blood. It is no more dependent on the um, endocrine control. It rather becomes an autocrine control or it goes into a pilot mode. Means how much milk is removed, 
the same amount of milk or little more is getting produced. How frequently the milk is removed, the same frequency the milk will be produced. So if the mother has one baby, so according to the need of the baby, the milk production gets adjusted. If the mother has twins or triplets, accordingly, the milk production gets adjusted. Right? So this control or, you know, this autocrine control is established from day eight. So usually after this period, uh, engorgement is not there and the, uh, you know, the breast has got adjusted into the demand supply mode. Right? So the next phase will be, or the last phase will be the involution where uh, when the mother starts weaning the baby with the introduction of complementary food, it starts from either six to nine months period. The uh, milk production slowly reduces as the need for exclusive breast milk will be reduced. So at this point of time, if the mother wants to relactate, so if the if she increases the frequency of feeding again, you know she will get into the galactopoiesis and again she will start getting the demand supply uh, uh, balance so that she can increase her milk production also. So when you are dropping the feeds, then slowly the involution will start. So this is roughly how the lactation stages are going to go. So understanding of this will help us. Uh, you know, when you're working with mothers and their babies so that you will know uh, how you can guide them towards better lactation. So now let us understand the physiology of, you know, the uh, lactation. So we all know that there is a neuronal network for the letdown reflex. There is a neuronal network for milk production also. So the... Uh, the sensory input or the sensory trigger which is required is suckling at the breast. So when the baby is suckling at the breast, so the sensory inputs are going to the pituitary and the, to the uh, hypothalamus and it is going to trigger the release of oxytocin. So oxytocin is the hormone which is going to help in the letdown reflex or the release of milk. So as the baby suckles, the hormone level, the oxytocin level increases and this oxytocin is going to go to the alveoli. It sends signals to the alveoli. So the myoepithelial cells, see the alveo the around the lactosides, there are also muscular cells which will contract and it will expel the milk into the lactiferous ducts, right? So these uh, uh, contraction will happen <clears throat> under the influence of oxytocin hormone, which will result in the letdown reflex or the milk will be let down, right? So we know that the most important signal is the suckling input, which is coming to the nipple and to the areola. As the oxytocin is getting released, simultaneously, the oxytocin also triggers, there is another feedback loop which will help in the release of prolactin. If we all know during pregnancy, the prolactin hormone is not released. So with the baby suckling or with the constant milk removal, oxytocin will be released and oxytocin will help in the release of prolactin hormone. And this prolactin hormone is the milk producing hormone. So with the rise in the prolactin level, the lactosides are getting activated. They are getting more receptors. So their milk producing capability is increasing. So this is the mechanism by which the milk production is going to increase. So baby suckles. So then the, it triggers the uh, release of the letdown reflex because of oxytocin. So the milk is going to be let down. Simultaneously, it triggers the release of prolactin, so more milk is going to be produced. So if the mother is going to feed the baby for 20 minutes or half an hour in one feed, so when the baby is suckling, the milk will be released. So the more length of time the baby is suckling, more prolactin is going to be released. So before the next feed, more milk is going to be made. So this is a very simple mechanism 
which is which we need to educate all the mothers because many mothers think that uh, uh, they will wait they will uh, they will accumulate milk in the breast so that there will be more milk and then they will feed less frequently but that is not the way it works more suckling means more prolactin more oxytocin more milk production so this is how the loop is going to work here there is another important thing to consider it is the um, innervation of the breast so the breast is getting innervated by the intercostal nerves two to six here the most important nerve is the fourth intercostal nerve which is supplying the areola and the nipple right those sensitivity of the areola and the nipple is very important. So we need to have intact sensation in the areola and the nipple because this sensation is the one which is going to trigger oxytocin release and prolactin release. So here, another important thing, you know, practically when we are uh, seeing mothers, it is important for us to know. There are many mothers who may be using a nipple sheet a silicon nipple sheet. It is a flexible one, yes, no doubt. And it gives a uh, suckling input very close to, uh, you know, holding on the breast. So it, it is more similar to the direct breastfeeding. So, at, but at the same time, when you are using the nipple sheet for a longer period of time, you are going to block the sensory input which the mother can get through the uh, nipple and the areola. So it is going to have an effect on the milk production. So if we can communicate this to the mother, it is a good motivation for her to learn to directly latch the baby to the breast and she may want to wean off the nipple sheet. Otherwise, mothers may feel that, oh, this is more convenient. I will keep using the nipple sheet for a longer period of time. But this is going to have a negative effect on the milk production. So one main reason why um, you may get a referral for lactation is because all the time mothers feel that there is inadequate milk production, right? So mothers always feel that my that they are always in doubt. It's my milk sufficient for the baby. Uh, you know, these are all doubts which mothers always have. So we also as professionals, when we have to counsel somebody, it is important for us to remember certain important factors which are going to influence the milk production. Right? I always tell mothers, it is not what you are going to eat which will affect your milk production. So many times, um, you know, a C-section mother or their family may say that See, she has not eaten anything. Uh, she is only on IV fluid. So how she will have milk? So that is why we are giving outside milk. So the what the mother is eating has nothing to do with the milk production, right? So the main factor which is going to influence milk production is how early and how frequently they remove the milk. So that is the reason why we are focusing on the golden hour or the first 60 minutes post birth where we need to give the, you know, the baby access to the breast so that the baby can start suckling early. Right? So even whether it is a vaginal birth or C-section, the breast crawl or the first skin-to-skin -skin contact is very essential, which will give that early milk re removal, uh, the opportunity for early milk removal. So if the mother <clears throat> has had a uh, uh, you know, preterm birth or something like that, it is very essential to encourage the mother to start expressing the milk as soon as 12 hours after birth. So by having a regular pumping schedule it is possible to uh, encourage early you know milk production so that by the time the baby in the uh, you know nicu is ready for nursing the mother's milk supply has also built up sufficiently so it becomes easier the second thing is the rooming in or you know keeping the mother and baby together and the skin to skin contact um see the the mother and baby are always called a diet. So we cannot separate a mother and baby because they are like one unit. Usually the, uh, the skin contact or they say that the baby should be in sensory proximity to the mother. Means the mother should be able to see the baby, hear the baby cry, 
should be able to touch the baby, should be able to smell the baby. So this kind of sensory proximity, if the mother is in sensory proximity with the baby, she gets the cues, you know, she gets the cues from the baby and responsive feeding will start earlier. So the, uh, you know, the, the more the mother understands the baby's cues and starts feeding, then uh, uh, her maternal instincts are getting activated and she gets attuned to the baby. So she can understand the baby's hunger cues. So she knows how to hold the baby then. No, this comes with practice. So early contact of the mother and baby being together and being in sensory proximity will help. Also, skin-to-skin -skin contact. So now in many hospitals, we practice this kangaroo care. So not just for the preterm babies, even for term babies. So they will encourage the mother to, you know, the bare baby, you know, without with only the diaper on the mother's bare chest and covered with the cloth. So the mother is in a reclined sit position and they are held together. And they can stay in that position for 20 minutes to 30 minutes. So this skin-to-skin -skin contact will, um, you know, keep the baby more relaxed, baby te body temperature, heartbeat, and baby's regulation gets better. And at the same time, it, uh, you know, the baby smell, the baby's touch will help in the increased release of oxytocin and prolactin. So, which is going to help in the milk production, right? So, for some reason, mother and baby are not able to have a, you know, proper suckling, then skin-to-skin the -skin contact should be increased more, right? So, which will increase the, uh, you know, quick release of milk. And the third factor is the release of hormones. The oxytocin and prolactin we already saw are the important hormones for milk production. And we also saw that lactogenesis too, where there is secretory activation. But sometimes there can be a delay in the uh, lactogenesis too or the secretory activation. So they say that operative delivery or uh, PCOD or um, uh, obesity, maternal obesity, type 1 diabetes, so these are all some of the risk factors where or labor analgesia or a prolonged labor, many factors uh, you can see which can delay. So they can delay the uh, secretory activation. So instead of the uh, milk coming in, uh, coming in at day three, it may take day four, day five, day six, right? So we, then the mother is not able to... Uh, you know, uh, give the, her own breast milk to the baby. So at these situations, see, we may sometimes we don't know the reason why it happens, but some mothers are not able to see the milk on the third day, right? So then in those situations, when you start giving lot of skin-to-skin -skin contact and give lot of suckling, so if the child will require formula at that time, but if the child gets to suckle on the breast for 15, 20 minutes after which the formula is given, then the breast gets more stimulation. Then you are looking on early and frequent milk removal, which will enhance the milk production. And the last thing is the maternal stress or depression. We all know that stress is going to reduce the hormones. So when mother is in a lot of stress, oxytocin release is not good. So milk letdown will be poor. And um, here, very important thing which we need to remember is how innocently sometimes relatives or uh, hospital staff or sometimes the lactation professionals may also say some words which may work on the mother's mind. Like sometimes if the you know family members will say that, oh, in our time, we used to have plenty of milk. All the milk used to ooze out. I used to wear, uh, you know, breast pads to, you know, uh, catch that extra milk. These days, you girls are not eating well, so not much milk. So this can work on the mother's mind. So there is no, there, actually, the fact is that there is, is not a realistic expectation. On day three, so much milk is not produced, which the uh, mother-in-law who whose lactation experience is 30 years back, she may not remember. Similarly, a nurse who may just on the 
we just comment that, oh, your nipple is little flat and it is drawn inward. So the baby is finding it difficult to lash. So make the mother to keep thinking and thinking that something is wrong with me. Something is wrong with my body. I'm not able to give because of something which is wrong with me, which may keep working on the mother a lot and it may come in the way of uh, breastfeeding success. Right. So there could be other, there are other reasons like if there is already some, uh, you know, maternal depression, all those history of uh, um, uh, psychiatric illness. So that is a different thing. But the new mother, because of the hormones which are moving up and down, so they can be in a, uh, they are not clear in their mind. So they may, their mood can be fluctuating. And uh, these kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, comments which innocently come from people can put them into stress. Right. So the most important factor which is essential for increasing the milk production is frequent suckling at the breast. Okay. And a mother who is less stressed. So those are the two important factors. Okay. So something about the breast milk property. Um, the, uh, the colostrum or the first milk. So uh, this, it is the light golden color honey-like texture, uh, you know, it is not white in color. So this is the colostrum, which has more um, proteins, more uh, immunoglobulins. So there are a lot of lysosomes and uh, um, uh, live cells, which are essential for uh, giving the first line of immunity to the infant, right? And uh, the cholesterol, if you look at the milk volume, the cholesterol is only 60 ml in a day, right? In a day, only 60 ml is produced. So which means, which is half a teacup. So it's almost only half a teacup. It's not a large volume of milk which will be produced. And the, uh, the cholesterol in every feed, it is going to be only one tablespoon. Just one second, right? Jitu, Jitu, Jitu. Just one second, I'm just going to... Sorry. Right, so the, um, the cholesterol is going to be the 60 ml in a day, so which is only one tablespoon per feed. Right, so it is very important for us to uh, tell the mother to keep her expectation realistic. Many mothers have the expectation that immediately after birth they will make volumes of milk, which will not happen. So cholesterol is going to be there for the first 48 to 72 hours. So the volume of cholesterol is going to be low. And the size of the baby's belly is also very small, just 5 to 10 ml on day one. And the size of the belly slowly increases by week one, it will be able to hold around 40 ml. Accordingly, the milk volume is going to get increased, right? So the milk volume, once the mature milk comes in, so it steadily starts to increase. And by, you know, by the end of one month, the mother is able to make around 500 ml, right? And... Uh, it can, the maximum amount of milk which is produced is usually 1100 to 1200 ml per day. So that is the volume of milk produced on an average. Mothers make anywhere between 600 ml to 1100 ml of milk. Right? And uh, see many mothers, they get confused with the size of the breast. So some mothers may think that with the smaller size in breast, their milk producing capacity will go down. But uh, the research says that it has nothing to do with the size of the breast. So every mother will be able to make almost similar volumes of milk. There can be a difference in the storage capacity depending on the size of the breast. A mother who has a larger storage capacity or a larger breast may feed less often. So she may feed only eight times in a day. She still makes over a span of 24 hours only 700 to 1100 ml of milk. But a mother who has a smaller breast size may, may, may have a storage capacity of 
you know, lesser storage capacity. So she may feed more often. So you may see that mother is feeding, say, around 12 to 16 times in a day. So the 24-hour milk volume remains the same. Right? So this is important. So because um, here again, uh, sometimes mothers are told that you should not feed your baby so often. Your baby is feeding all day long. Uh, our babies used to feed and then they sleep for three hours, four hours. So it depends on, uh, you know, how much milk the baby is consuming in each feed. And in breastfeeding mothers, you cannot uh, exactly calibrate how much milk the baby is consuming in each feed. Right? So, and the properties of the uh, milk will change according to the uh, age of the baby. For example, the uh, milk of a preterm mother is uh, having more cholesterol-like properties with more IgGs and uh, 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 more protein in them, which will enhance the uh, weight gain and which will give more uh, resistance from infections. There are some special components in the human milk, like uh, the arachnoic acid is there and the DHA is there. And now they, now they say there are uh, other things called the human um, uh, oligosaccharides. So human milk oligosaccharides or the HMO. So these are like the prebiotics. So we all know probiotics and prebiotics. So this is what they say is that um, in the uh, gut of babies who are exclusively breastfed, there is more colonization of uh, good or the healthy bacteria, which are the bifidobacteria and the lactobacillus. So these uh, healthy bacteria, they colonize the gut because they, uh, they get seeded with the uh, uh, good bacteria as they come through the vaginal passage, as well as they get it from the skin of the uh, um, areola and from the breast milk. Right, so they get a regular inflow of this bifidobacteria and lactobacillus, which they say will uh, form the gut immune system. So the uh, immunity, the first line of immunity from the gut, starts with the uh, you know ingestion of uh, healthy bacteria because a newborn baby does not have any bacteria inside the gut. So. After the baby comes out, the moment the baby starts suckling on the breast, the baby's gut gets colonized with the healthy bacteria. So which will be able to fight against other pathogens, right? So the uh, HMOs, which are the uh, human milk oligosaccharides, are food, the prebiotics or the food to the uh, bifidobacteria, which will help in the proliferation of more of uh, you know, those kind of bacteria and it will suppress the development of more pathogens, right? So this forms a good uh, gut flora, which will give protection from severe intestinal diseases in newborn baby. Okay, so now let us consider, so this is a little bit about the uh, lactation physiology we wanted to understand. Let us see... Uh, how we are going to expand our scope of practice. So if you are, as a lactation professional, if you are going to uh, uh, meet a mother in the antenatal period, then, uh, you know, if you are already doing a childbirth class or you have pregnant ladies coming to you, uh, you know, with uh, pelvic joint issues or back pain, so you can slowly expand your practice of, you know, you can give some lactation consultation also. In the sense, you can talk about breast care. Uh, 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 you should talk about the importance of uh, breastfeeding and beginning the breastfeeding in the golden hour. So not to miss the breast crawl. Whether it is vaginal birth or C-section, it is possible. The first feed has to be breastfeed. So these are all things which you may want, which it is possible to uh, share in this period of time. And usually uh, one session understanding uh, how you will begin your lactation, the positions and the importance of nursing, all those things, if you give it, it helps the mother to stay uh, 
you know, more informed. So she knows that she has to start breastfeeding as soon as possible. So in the post-delivery period, when you are not there around, so this information which you have given the mother in the antenatal period is going to come handy. It will work like her instinct and she will ask for frequent breastfeeding. She will uh, ask for help as soon as it is required, so which will result in better lactation success. So uh, in this time, uh, if you are going to uh, see a mother, then uh, one breast examination will be essential because if there are gross asymmetries in the development of the breast, so which can uh, indicate some hormonal imbalance, there will be some difference. So the left and the right breast will not be the same size. There will be some difference. But if the one breast is well developed, the other breast is not developed, then there is some problem on that breast. The lactation may be a difficult uh, you know, thing to happen. So, and the other thing is you need to examine the nipple. A simple pinch test will be, and we all know that breast areola nipple can be in different sizes and shapes, and uh, it is not going to affect the lactation success. But uh, the stretchability of the nipple is important. So nipples can look protractile. It can look flat. It can look like a dimple. So that is all absolutely fine in terms of anatomy. What we are more concerned, you want to hold the nipple like that. So just gently, uh, you know, uh, pull the nipple and then hold the nipple and stretch it out. If it comes, say, around half an inch, so one inch is stretchable, then it is a functional nipple. A seemingly uh, protractile nipple, when you try to, uh, uh, seemingly flat nipple, sometimes when you stretch it out, it moves inwards, it looks protracted, it looks uh, retracted nipple. But sometimes a nipple which looks like having a dimple, when you just you know push the areola and then pull the nipple outside, the nipple comes out well, right? So many times, the nipples which are looking like retracted nipples also, the baby can hold and suckle really well, right? So antenatally, when we examine this, this will be uh, helpful in deciding on some plan of action because only 1% of women will have tethered nipple where it is really stuck to the uh, uh, tissue behind and they, they are little hard to be pulled down. So in those conditions, what you would want to do by, by term age, after completion of 37 weeks, you may want to suggest the mother to use something like a nipple puller. It is like a simple suction device. It's a small cup with a bulb. So you can the mother can use that and gently she can pull the nipple outside. We don't want anything to be done prior to that because we don't want to trigger an early labor, right? So this is what we can do when the mother is going to visit you in the antenatal period. But um, the oh, most... Yeah. Hello? Should I continue? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So uh, in the postnatal period, this is, uh, you know, it is very important if you want to work in the area of lactation to so be attached to some hospital or a maternity unit because that is when you are going to get your regular clientele, right? So uh, bedside lactation counseling is a very good way to improve your lactation skills. So if you want to know how you should counsel a parent or, you know, how you can... Um, uh, support the mother in her breastfeeding journey. So this is a good place to start with because you get hands-on experience on how you can help a mother to successfully breastfeed, right? So this is the best place. And uh, here we don't want to talk about uh, why it is important to uh, do the breast crawl because all the stages has gone. So now you have a mother with the infant in hand who is struggling to feed the baby. So here, there are few things which you want to look at. So one is you want to show the mother how to position the baby correctly and how to position herself. So good back support and all those things. And the second thing is you want to help the mother to get a good latch, right? And you will also talk about the cue-based feeding. So you, will, you have to teach the mother. See, this is the time the mother is very receptive. What? 
at the same time her attention span is also very short right so you want to decide what is that info important information you want to give to the mother so you don't want to give lecture to the mother here so whatever lecture you want to give you should finish in the antenatal period because in the postnatal mother postnatal period the mother is very tired right and she has a crying baby. Probably she is already upset that the baby is not feeding. Uh, she is just struggling with uh, feeding, and the stitches may be hurting her. You know, either from the C-section or from the episiotomy. So you need to make things simple and easy for her. Right. So uh, you will have to first show her how she can wake up a sleepy baby because many babies are very sleepy so just unwrapping the baby looking at the feeding cues and how you should look at the feeding cues and not wait for crying because many mothers will wait for crying and crying is the late feeding cue and you put a crying baby on the breast the baby is not going to feed and the mother will think that my baby is thrusting the head back and moving away my baby is refusing me so babies don't refuse the mother it is that uh, you know they have gone up into that, you know, uh, 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 what to say. So the, the, the behavioral cycle has escalated too fast that the baby has gone into crying. Now the baby has to be calmed down before the baby can latch, right? So, uh, so that is important. And there are many positions which you can suggest. So the mother, usually the cradle position, we would not, uh, recommend for a newborn baby because the baby's head needs to be nicely held. So usually the cross cradle position is a good position. Um, if the mother is having larger breasts, then you will want to use the football hold, um, you know, because that is much easier. And even for C-section mothers, the football hold will be better. Uh, it is also good to use the laid back position. So the mother is leaning behind and the baby can be on top. Uh, that can be another good position. Even lying down position, side lying position is very good to uh, feed a infant. So, but if you are going to use the side lying position, you have to tell them specifically the baby should not be swaddled. So, the baby should be an unswaddled baby and then the mother can feed the baby. And uh, many times there are concerns that can we feed the baby in the lying down position? It can cause aspirations and all those stuff. So if there are such concerns, some, somebody, you know, at least in the initial days, some family member should be encouraged to be with the mother. So if the mother is sleepy, the baby mother sleeps off, then after the feed, the family member can pick up the baby and work the baby and then put the baby back on the cradle, right? But all these positions can be safely used for successful breastfeeding. If we limit the mother saying that, no, no, you have to only take this position for feeding, it is going to come in the way of breastfeeding success. And we know the repetitive strain injury will be more if you are going to use the same position again and again, you know, for several days together. So the same thing can happen with the lactating mothers also. Same position, same hold, the hands may get strained, so they may get you know, tendinitis or they may get shoulder pain. So changing the position, having good back support and, you know, sometimes sitting on the chair, sometimes, you know, uh, lying down on the bed or on a reclined chair, when they have more options to change, then, you know, it is going to get better. So the, okay, so these are things you are, you are going to, uh, you know, show the mother and uh, you will, the most important thing for a, a counselor when you go for the postnatal visit is getting the latch. So the latch means how the baby is going to hold on to the mother's nipple and areola and suckle the mouth. So if the latch becomes good, then we are more likely to have breastfeeding success, the more possibility of good milk transfer and then the milk production will be maintained so both the mother and baby are going to be happy with the, you know, the uh, breastfeeding uh, cycle, and the pediatrician is going to happy, going to be happy because the baby is going to gain milk. So the first thing which comes to my, uh, you know, my first agenda is going to help the baby to latch onto the uh, mother's breast properly, and that has to happen before 48 hours. So the more frequently the mother and baby practice, because it's a learned skill for the mother, 
for the baby also it is a learned skill because to though the baby comes with the uh, 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 the sucking reflex the reflex is going to get shaped depending of, upon the uh, experience which the baby gets so if i'm going to see the baby on day 3 and first two days the uh, mother could not breastfeed the baby and the baby was uh, fed formula milk from a spoon the sucking pattern changes because with the spoon the this kind of from the uh, you know the tongue and the lip movements are changed and the deep suckling movement is not there so if even we may think it is only two days but if you look at it it is nearly some 12 feet so the early experience of the baby is going to shape their adaptive behavior so that the, the baby must have changed the suckling pattern according to the way the milk is introduced, right? So if this happens, your job also is to ensure that you give suck training to the baby. So, so you have to try different things. So you have to see what will... Uh, make latch possible what will make the baby to start suckle and uh, you know uh, latch onto the breast nicely and uh, remove the milk properly right so you will use the fail fast technique so you will try different position okay this position is not working okay within five minutes you say no this is not working you change the position right or you may want to keep the baby more awake and then you will try if that nothing is working and the baby is not trying to, even when the baby holds the breast, the baby is just waiting because the baby is used to milk pouring into the mouth. The baby is not suckling. Then, okay, now you have to try the suckle training so you can train the baby to suckle. So with a clean finger, nicely wash, no nails, you can gently uh, massage the perioral area, gently enter the oral cavity, and you can keep the padded surface of your finger on the roof of the mouth, on the palate. And you can gently do a, you know, a forward motion, which may trigger the suckle. Or you may want to come to the floor of the mouth that is on the tongue. And you may want to do a mild forward movement of the tongue so that you are encouraging the tongue to come more in the front. Right? Otherwise, the baby who does this kind of a thing, the baby is not allowing the nipple entry inside. The nipple does not enter inside the mouth, then it is not, you know, it is not going to be possible for efficient milk removal. When you introduce your finger, you will get to understand the suckling pattern and accordingly you can counsel the parent. Right? Uh, so here again, uh, you know, if there are concerns like an inverted or a tethered nipple, these are all difficult situations, right? So if it is an inverted nipple, uh, changing the position, a laid back position, if we use the gravity is going to uh, make it easy for the baby to, uh, uh, you know, stabilize the jaw on the mother's breast and the baby may be able to pull the nipple outside, right? Sometimes there is a tongue tie or a lip tie. So uh, if my baby is not latching well, so immediately that triggers your brain to think why this latching is not happening. If, the, uh, if there is an inverted nipple or you feel the nipples are not well stretched up, stretchable, then you may want to work on it. Sometimes you push on the areola a little bit, you give little back pressure because the areola may have become little stiff with the milk and the, then the nipple may get more stretchable and you may get a good latch. Sometimes still you don't get the latch or you may see that the nipple is getting pinched or it is getting bitten. So then you will see how the you know uh, baby's jaw movements are. If the, if the cheeks are getting puckered, then also you know that yes, the latch is not good. So then you may want to observe the baby's uh, you know tongue and the lips. So it is possible to pick up a, a tongue tie very easily. So you see that there is a thin uh, tissue underneath the tongue and the baby doesn't protrude the tongue. And sometimes the tongue looks, when the baby is crying, looks like a heart shape. So then you will be able to figure out the tongue tie. So uh, there are a lot of uh, differences in opinion regarding whether the tongue tie needs to be released for effective feeding and whatever. But 
the first thing we can do is change the position of PD. So if you are trying a, a cross cradle position, you change to a football position or something, sometimes it makes it easier for the baby to start feeding. So by changing the position, you may be able to, uh, you know, encourage the baby to uh, latch deeply and be able to, uh, you know, uh, remove the milk. If need be, then you, if, if the latching is not happening, the baby is not doing good milk removal, then you may have to refer the baby. So the pediatrician may uh, refer the uh, child to a, a ENT or to a, a you know, pediatric dentist who may do, then the, they may go for a tongue tie procedure so that after that, the baby will be able to feed better. Okay. So the other uh, area of practice would be in your outpatient, you know, this is in the bedside. So after uh, discharge from the hospital, the, you know, the uh, mother may want to come back to you. So there may be complaints of low milk supply or uh, there may be nipple pain or nipple is getting damaged or engorgement or they may say my baby is not feeding well. Uh, there is poor milk supply. You know, these are all things uh, they may come back to you in the early days of, uh, uh, you know, lactation. So most of the problems are related to poor latch. So they may not be latching the baby deeply. So it is very important to teach the mother how to have a uh, you know, deep latch so that the uh, efficiency of milk removal will be very good. See, usually if this is the nipple and this is the baby's mouth, many mothers think that if the baby is feeding like this, it is sufficient. So, but we know that all the milk ducts are on the areola, the more of the areola should go inside the baby's mouth, right? So, when we are teaching the mother to latch, we usually tell, you point the nipple to the roof of the mouth, right? So, to the mouth or near the nose. So you have to trigger the rooting reflex. So when you trigger the rooting reflex, the baby makes a big open mouth. When the baby makes a big open mouth, you simply slide the breast inside. So with a big open mouth, and after a rooting reflex, when the baby roots, the baby immediately starts to suckle. So when the baby is suckling with a you know good portion of the breast inside the mouth, the nipple moves to the back of the mouth. It is gone beyond the hard palate, so towards the soft palate. So this is when the nipple will not get damaged. So it is very important to teach the mother the right latch. And when the baby is latched properly, you will show the mother the important pointers. So you can also show the mother how the jaw is moving, that the jaw should be uh, deep in the breast, the cheeks are touching the breast, the nose will automatically be free. And you can, the mother can also see the rhythmic jaw movement. The mother can see the baby gulping the milk. So these drinking sounds can be audible. And these things when the mother sees, then she will get reassured. Right? So uh, engorgement is again another uh, aspect wherein uh, here the, the idea is to prevent an engorgement. When the mother feeds the baby at regular intervals and if she uh, does not feed from a hole, you know, because there are now many fancy uh, breastfeeding bras. So the mother is not opening up the uh, breast completely, is not observing her own breast because the breast tissue can extend all the way up to the axilla also. So incomplete milk removal will result in engorgement. Sometimes the milk ducts will get clogged. So there may be lumps, so which the mother was unaware. It becomes too much that it becomes painful, red, mother gets fever, then it may come to the notice of the mother. So you have to educate the mother about daily massage, ensure good draining of milk from all the uh, parts of the breast. So the breast has to remain soft. So if there is complete removal of milk, see, complete removal will not happen. Only two thirds of the milk gets removed. But when that happens regularly, the breast will not get engorged, right? So this is uh, these are all things which is very important to uh, tell the new mother. And when they come for an outpatient consult, so whatever is the problem, accordingly, we are going to help them. Some mothers may want to uh, uh, wean the baby. 
So here again, education is a must. So uh, a mother who wants to go to go back to work may think that, okay, uh, I have to go back to work in another one month or two months. So let me start weaning the baby now. I will start giving a bottle. So when the, the, the if she still has two months, why do you want the baby to start weaning now? Right? So two months, the baby can have milk. Uh, from the mother directly and just 10 days or you know two weeks before she she has to join back to work then she can you know start giving express breast milk or you know through a bottle or something or with a cup and spoon it can be fed and there are many mothers who, who are able to feed the baby directly in the night and early morning and when they are out for work in the daytime, the baby is given solids or other formula milk. So, you know, then there is no requirement for weaning. So when they are educated, they know how they can wean the baby. Similarly, now WHO says exclusive breast milk for six months and continue breastfeeding for two years or beyond, depending on the... Uh, 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 what the mother, individual mother and baby feels like. So there are many mothers who follow the baby-led weaning. So they will decide, the baby decides when they can wean the baby, uh, they, when they are ready to uh, wean the breastfeed. So uh, education of about the weaning will also be very helpful. Sometimes because of family pressure, the mother may think that now I should wean. So when they know that WHO recommends breastfeeding till two years, they may want to continue to breastfeed. And without any ill effect on the uh, uh, mother returning back to work, she can continue to feed the baby. She can feed in public. So all these things, all the uh, the airports and you know bus, bus stands and railway station, everything is geared up for uh, uh, lactating mothers. So there are lactation rooms available everywhere. So it should not be a problem for them, right? And with the COVID time, we have been doing a lot of online or teleconsultation. So there are small change we need to do when we are doing teleconsultation. So first we need to have a, you know, a telephonic conversation with the mother, what her main problem is, what is it that she wants? So what is the main problem she is facing? So you understand the problem, you take a note of it. and then you will tell the mother that you want to observe when the mother is breastfeeding because you are not there available directly to help the mother to you know, breastfeed correctly. So you need to observe. So when the mother is uh, doing her next feed, then you want to observe for say around five minutes. Then you drop the call and after she has finished the feed and when she is relaxed and the mother is given to somebody else or the mother is when the baby is sleeping, then the mother comes for a consult. So where you are going to say, you know, these are the difficulties I am seeing. So this is what you can do. So you may want to make some suggestions and you may support them with some YouTube videos, which will make it easy. You know, it is all about adult learning. So they have to uh, problem solve. You have to involve them in their learning process. So they are actively involved in how they want to make changes in their, you know, their breastfeeding approach for uh, more successful lactation. So sometimes on the same day, I like to uh, see the mother in the next feed. Okay, I suggested you these things, how you have been able to do. Then you may be able to guide the mother also. So in that same day, you may want to see the mother say for 15, 15 minutes, three, four times, so that you are able to successfully help the mother in the breastfeeding journey. So this is how, you know, in a teleconsultation, it usually works. So can we have uh, last five minutes, uh, Nehal? Okay. So, uh, so if you want to enter into the field of lactation, uh, there are many uh, ways of doing it. So the golden standard, if we look at, that is to do the IBCLC, which is the International Board Certified Lactation Consultant. So if you become an International Board Certified Lactation Consultant, those people will write lactation consultant after their names. Okay. So that is a very uh, 
uh, tough course to take because it requires rigorous practice and they have three pathways and uh, this IBCLC is recognized worldwide. So if you are planning to uh, go you know, out of India, you want to establish your practice somewhere else. So if you are, uh, then it is worth, uh, you know, going for this rigorous uh, certification process uh, because there are three pathways. So the, uh, you know, in every, first you need to get some lactation specific clinical practice then you go for the certification examination, then you will get certified. You know, that is the method. But to get this uh, you know, lactation-specific clinical practice, they have given three pathways. So the pathway one is for health professionals. This includes doctors, dentists, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, uh, nutritionists. So health professionals. So here, apart from your, uh, uh, you know, all the... Uh, uh, credits which we have for the different courses, you should have 1,000 hours of lactation-specific uh, clinical practice in a supervised uh, setting, which is like lots. 1,000 hours is lots. So if you are practicing alone, that will not get counted. So it should be supervised. So the exact details, when you go to their website, you will get to know. So the second pathway is you can have some accredited lactation concern, uh, education program. So if you are a non-medical professional, so you need to understand that non-medical professionals can also become lactation consultant, right? So with this, uh, they have some 95 hours of uh, lactation education uh, courses. There are many, uh, you know, all these uh, uh, beginedindia.com and all, they give this kind of uh, uh, courses which will help you to certify for the IBCLC. Okay. So plus you need to have 300 hours of supervised lactation specific clinical practice. Usually it should be uh, from a IBCLC. So if you, you should have somebody whom you know who is the IBCLC under whom you can work, where you can, and it should not be just looking, you know, observing. You should be working when uh, under their supervision. It is, you know, very specific mm -hmm. like that. And the third pathway is wherein uh, uh, you will have 500 hours of directly supervised lactation training from a IBPO. So these are the three pathways. So this is a very uh, hard, uh, hard path. So I have not taken this path. So I have taken the CAPA certification, which involves a two-day um, workshop and a self-paced learning uh, you know, they have uh, recommended books which you have to read and then uh, some projects to do and an exam to take. So you get two years of time. It's a self-paced learning. So you get a certificate. So this is also uh, valid in many of the uh, foreign countries. So if you go to their site, you will get to understand uh, in which other countries it is, uh, you know, valid. Uh, so in India, this breastfeeding promotion network of India, BPNI. So they are giving short courses. So which is like a certificate, which is for five days. So if you take a five days course, which is a nine to uh, five uh, uh, day course. So uh, breastfeeding and infant and young child feeding counseling and support skill training is given. So if you go to their website in BPNI, then you can, you will be able to look for these courses. This is happening all over. Like there are courses happening in Pondicherry also, Hyderabad also happens in Delhi also. So you can, um, you know, learn. So, you know, it depends on um, how keen you are and, uh, you know, how much you want to work. So if you are new to the uh, lactation, first, what I would say is what, what I did was, uh, I used to do childbirth education. So I used to teach uh, pregnancy exercise. So when they were coming, so they are also keen to know about lactation. So I used to read, I used to read books. So there is a lot of information available. So uh, certification is one part and learning is another part, right? So you need not be certificate, but you can learn a lot of things. So when you learn and when you do sessions for mothers, then you pick up more skill. So then when my mother's delivered and they were, uh, they said that, why don't you just have a look and see I'm struggling with feeding. I started helping them in their, you know, feeding. So I used to 
uh, uh, encounter difficulties also. Oh, why this mother is not able to feed? Oh, this tongue ties there, then what I should do? So then I start reading more and more. So I, you know, that is that is another way in which you can pick up the skills. And then if you still think, yes, I'm interested, then you can go for any of these certificates. Because um, if you are going to attach, get yourself attached to a small maternity home in your vicinity, if you know a gynecologist in your area and you, you learned something about lactation, you have read a lot, you have seen videos, you know, you, you, you have some skills, but you need practice. You can get attachment in such a place and you can start seeing the new mothers. So then you will know whether how much you are interested in, right? So if you feel, yes, this is something which I would like to do, then you can go for a certification. So if you do the BPNI certification and all, so the cost will be little less. Right, it costs, I think, around 20,000 for this five days of workshop. So, you know, the cost will be little less and then you can have a certificate in hand. Or then, you know, because if you go to a bigger hospital or a corporate hospital and all, they to, to work for with the new mothers, they may ask you for a certification that, you know, that whether you, you have done some courses which will make you eligible to be a lactation professional, then that kind of certification will be helpful. So then it makes some sense to invest more money and get a certification also. Right. If you feel that I'm not so much interested, then you can stop there or you can work with the antenatal mother. You can, you know, work on that area. If you are going to be very keen and if you want to take it full time, I want to be a lactation consultant, then it makes sense to work hard on the, you know, getting the IBTL. Right. So this is what um, I feel will be a good way to choose your um, path ahead. So I think we have, I have completed the question. So we can take questions. So uh, there are some questions in the chat. Should I start taking them, Nehan? Priya, you can ask a question. Okay, okay, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, there is a question. Uh, there any preparation that uh, can be done prior to deliver for uh, before lactation? Uh, see the uh, for preparation the body prepares itself. So the uh, milk producing glands are started. The, the lactogenesis one has started already. So the milk production has started by twenty four weeks. So this is the time we just need to reassure the mother. That see, there are changes in the breast, there are changes in the areola nipple. So you reassure the mother that your breast is ready for lactation. So in terms of preparation, there are only two things you need to do. Give good support to the breast. So wear supportive bra throughout your pregnancy. So, but this is not the time for wearing fancy bras or strapless bras because it can cause damage to the uh, growing milk producing cell. And you want to uh, apply some coconut oil to the nipple and areola uh, and not remove the natural oil. So not soaping the nipples when they are taking bath. So this will keep the nipple supple and will also protect from fungal infection. We all know that fungal infection, if it comes to the nipples, it will go to the baby also. Right? So this is the only preparation that is required. We don't recommend any stretching, pulling of the nipple because these things can trigger a preterm labor and which we don't want. So if there is a tethered nipple or something, whatever we do, it will be after 37 weeks, we can use a nipple puller. We can gently stretch the nipple out. So this is the only preparation which is required. Nature takes care of all other preparations. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, second question. Uh, how to avoid uh, feeding complications like latching or cracked nipples? Okay. 
so the uh, the main reason why uh, you know the crack nipples happen or injury to the nipple is because of poor latch so a uh, good latch is a very important prerequisite for effective breastfeeding to happen so very important to teach the mother correct latch so when the latching happens correctly uh, you have to teach the mother how she can find out if the latch is correct so latch if it is correct then nipple problems won't happen right so deep latch is a must so depending on the size of the breast the size of the nipple you will change the position you will also show the mother that when the nipple comes out from the baby's mouth see, when the baby is feeding you will see the baby's mouth should be nicely open the lips should be nicely retracted uh, jaw nicely open head should not be flexed it should be slightly extended these are all positions you know head body hips should be in same line belly on belly contact so baby should be held in a nicely supported way all these things will help in promoting a good latch but once the feeding is over the baby is removed from the breast the first thing the mother should watch is the nipple the nipple when it comes out from the baby's mouth should come out round and moist if the nipple looks dry and has a pinched appearance means the latch is poor this nipple is going to get damaged so it doesn't take more than one feed to damage a nipple but it takes two to three days for the nipple to heal so the best way to prevent damage the best way to heal a damage is to prevent one so one feed where the mother is pulling on the nipple is going to damage the nipple so correctly latching and ensuring that the baby is feeding in the correct position throughout is very important so that nipple damage can be avoided ma'am ma there is one question uh, it is advised to premature babies to feed every 2 hours compulsory so as you discussed few mo mothers due to storage may feed only 7 to 8 times how to cope up with this uh, so i didn't understand this question so every 2 hours feeding is compulsory in pre preterm babies but what is due to storage due to maybe uh, breast size uh... okay okay see uh, see when it comes to preterm babies the uh, the preterm babies growth requirement is different right and preterm babies may not wake up for feed so uh, babies need to be fed uh, on a schedule feed only for a preterm baby uh, till the time the baby is catching up with growth once the growth is well established then you know it may be possible to uh, have longer gaps between feeds but usually young infants when we give longer gap between feeds then the uh, baby's weight gain will get affected the young infant means in the first month the first four to five weeks so at this time the uh, milk volume is not really very high so by week 1 the milk volume is only 150 ml so per day so the baby has to be feeding frequently to be able to take this much volume of milk so so if you give a preterm baby very few number of feeds it may give inadequate nourishment so we have to feed the baby often oh ma'am another question how to schedule feeding babies if uh, there are two uh, twin babies okay so uh, with twin babies uh, see some in a, when the baby is preterm you know if the baby is a preterm baby and they are twin baby so preterm babies their suckling is going to be little weaker uh, so they with prematurity then their suck swallow breath is also not well developed and babies get fatigued easily between feeds during the feeds so it becomes very uh, essential to supplement them with express breast milk or formula milk so the baby will have lot of skin to skin contact first one baby will get skin contact then other baby will skin, get skin contact then one baby will be fed by the mother then the other baby will be fed by the mother right so sometimes mothers will like to keep one breast for one baby other breast for other baby then switch sides in the next feed 
if one baby is weaker the other baby is little stronger so you can first allow the uh, stronger baby to suckle on the breast so that baby will stimulate the let down well so all, all the hard work will be done by the uh, stronger baby then after that baby has had the feed then you get the weaker baby to feed on the same breast so the baby is having to do less hard work and the baby gets the milk and the milk which comes little later is more rich in protein and fat which will help a weaker baby to gain weight so after both the babies are mature enough and they are able to feed then both the babies can be fed simultaneously usually they use a football hold for both the babies so both the babies can be feeding simultaneously on the breast so it is all individual preference so what each mother will prefer each baby how they prefer so accordingly they can and but it is still a demand based feeding so uh, when you do breastfeeding usually uh, it is demand based feeding you are not going to schedule the feed there is no strict to our uh, mark uh, especially for a term baby if it is pre term baby you have to schedule the feed but if it is a term baby some feeds can be uh, after 3 hours also and that is absolutely fine Uh, there is another question. Which medication affect lactation? Uh, see, usually, um, see, I, I, I am not the person who can tell about medication. But there are, you know, the uh, epilepsy के लिए whatever medication is used. Uh, some antidepressants. So these are all some of the medication which can cause cross the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, 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 breast tissue and it can reach the milk. So there are many uh, medication which can be safely utilized also. So when uh, when the mother is a lactating mother, usually doctor gives safe medication. Simple jo paracetamol hai, antibiotics hai, they can all be uh, consumed by the breastfeeding mother. without any ill effect if mother who are uh, on antidepressant you know sometimes the mother is already having psychosis or you know some uh, schizophrenia she has to take medication so then what they uh, say is see then the medication are transferred through the breast milk so it is not that the mother cannot breastfeed so usually the if the antipsychotic medicine the mother is taking in the night so before the mother takes the medication she will pump the milk right and then after taking the medicine usually the medicine stays in the blood stream see for each medicine the uh, uh, the half life period or whatever you say you know the how long the medicine is remaining in the blood circulation is going to vary the doctor will be able to say that correctly so usually 8 hours so if the mother has taken the uh, antidepressant for 8 hours she will not feed and after that so she can start feeding the baby so you know in that meantime the expressed breast milk can be given by somebody else so when you are a breastfeeding mother whenever you are going for any medication when you are going to the doctor when you say that you are lactating accordingly the medicine is altered so that there are safe medicine which can be uh consumed by lactating mother okay ma'am thank you that much only questions are okay thank you so much It was a lovely time uh sharing with all of you all so thank you madam yeah thank you madam it was a really wonderful uh, lactation topic which is give very broad idea idea uh, i myself never heard in details about this topic so thanks a lot for sharing uh, your knowledge and deep into it so i would like to thanks to uh, my state team and all the participants who are there online and also on the uh, ip women cell fb page uh, thanks to the ip digital Uh, team for supporting and this webinar okay uh, kindly uh, check the updates with the ip youtube and all the social media for the upcoming webinar thank you so much thank you thank you so much